Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses. We're glad to be back after a break. I'm Marina Mazzi. And I'm Fadi Boris Puya. In this week's program, we want to discuss the situation of the uh, imprisoned labor activist, environmentalist, woman activist, who have been given long term prison sentences in Iran. And we're also going to be interviewing Mashad Afshar, an Iranian artist, especially on her work with regards to women's rights. But on the long term, prison uh, sentences, uh, some of which have been in the news. Uh, if you look at uh, labor activists, uh, Ismail Bakhshi, uh, activists from the sugarcane factory in Khuzestan, uh, and uh, Sepi de Golion, uh, they have been given 14 to almost 19 years respectively. Also editors of GOM magazine that have defended workers' rights have received up to 19 years each. There's, there's several uh, several of the activists, I'd like to name them. Uh, there's Mohammad Khanifar, Amir, Amir Qoli, Sanaz Ali Yari, Asal Muhammadi, Amir Hossein Muhammadi Fad. And of course, the outrage of the sentences is that, imagine, people have gotten 14 to almost 20 years in prison merely for demanding unpaid wages and for workers' rights. Just think about that for a while. Yeah, you remember in this very program we discussed the situation of the uh, half tapper sugar, uh, sugar cane factory workers' strike and it was open and everybody saw exactly what uh, um, Ismail Bakshi and um, his um, fellow workers were doing openly and they're defending the right for un the payment of unpaid wages uh, and privatization of the uh, the factory which has ruined lives of thousands of people in southern parts of Iran and everybody saw uh, you know the, the demands were justified and it actually uh, attracted huge sympathy across Iran and internationally and because of that the Islamic regime uh, has taken revenge on them and imp imprisoned them after a round of torture when it was exposed by Sepida early on when she was um, released on, on bail on, uh, uh, for a temporary period. She was arrested again and was both arrested and now been sentenced to 14 to 19 years. And of course one of yeah. the things, the charges against them is that they are against national security, that they are um, against public order. I mean these are actually accusations that can be leveled against the Iranian regime. Uh, and not against those who are fighting for basic human rights. You know, they say that in the Iranian constitution, people have a right to association, but it has to be uh, within the fundamentals of Islam. And of course, what's very clear is that any defense of rights is against the fundamentals of Islam and against the fundamentals of the Islamic regime. And uh, again, because of this huge amount of protests and the support it's getting, we're seeing that the regime is trying to uh, control the situation, but it is really uncontrollable. And we see that in other areas too, like the women's rights movement, the environmentalist movement, And I think that this seems to be a new uh, approach that the Islamic regime is taking. Uh, they're giving long-term prison sentences to labor and women's rights activists and environmentalists. A whole series of sentences will be given between 15 to 20 years, sometimes 25 years, long-term sentences for merely protesting. Uh, um, uh, a number of um, um, protesters on the 1st of May who were arrested um, and they are in prison. They haven't even been given sentences. Some of them have been given long-term prison sentences purely for demonstrating. I mean, where on earth can you get this on, uh, only in, in Islamic religion societies, particularly in Iran? And of course, if you look at the women's rights campaigners, I mean, basically they're women who've just walked in the streets, taken off their hijab, opposed to compulsory veiling rules. And you see people like Sabah Kord Afshari, who's got 22 years, who's a 22-year-old who's got 15 years in prison. You've got Yasaman Ariani, 16 years. Her mother, um, Munire Arab Shahi, 16 years. Mojgan Keshavar, 17 years, six months, uh, you know, for, uh, for doing this very simple act. And of course, they've been accused of violating national security, public order, all of that, but also 
prostitution because unveiling is equated with prostitution and moral corruption. That's only in, under in the Islamic regime. regime of Iran. Again, sorry. only on, under the Islamic re regime of Iran that women's rights activists are labeled as prostitutes and been sentenced yeah. uh, 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 based on that. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, the people who are sitting. Uh, and judging these sentences are the very people who've been torturers in the previous round uh, in the 80s that were responsible for execution of thousands of political prisoners in Iran. Now they are sitting as, as judges and uh, they are, they've occupied most of the government positions in Iran. And so it is really a continuation, the repression that uh, this regime was founded on uh, with the execution of hundreds of thousands, a hundred thousand actually is the number since it, it, it was established. Till now we see the repression continues in various ways. I think primarily the, the sentences are a way of trying to intimidate the public, stop protests, but what we're seeing is that the protests are really unstoppable and uh, I think this is something that, you know, when you look at these long-term sentences, it does seem that the regime is uh, is 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 afraid in a sense uh, of what is to come as a result of these protests and also uh, the environmental uh, activists who've been arrested for example uh, some of them for making a film about the asian cheetah which is disappearing in that area and four of them have been uh, accused of being uh, corrupt on earth that is the uh, death penalty, uh, actually, sentence, if, if it's uh, verified. And w the leader of a heritage foundation uh, was found dead in his cell after he was arrested. Suicide, they said. So it's, it's very, very serious what's happening there. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see this is the nature of the Islamic regime. It doesn't matter who you are. You, you, you're a tourist uh, crossing Iran. Uh, recently, we've seen that uh, um, a couple of Australians who were going uh, from Australia to London, they were entered in Iran, they were arrested, uh, they were bloggers, and they, they've been used as bargaining chip for, you know, uh, for prisoners who are with Australia and America and, uh, um, uh, and England. You'll see the dual nationals been uh, imprisoned yeah, on like Trump. People like Nazanin Zaghari, Radcliffe, Siamak. Namazi, Bagher Namazi, and many others. And, and these are ju uh, just hostages, really, that they're taken. And interestingly, uh, the um, uh, people who run away from this Islamic regime of Iran have the right to seek refuge. And look what the shameful Australian government is doing to the refugees in Iran uh, um, and uh, imprison them on the uh, islands far away when merely people are asking for refuge from yeah, this Islamic regime. And not regime. just actually uh, Australia, but also the United States. Uh, you can see a lot of the fortress Europe and so many people dying at the border to reach safety. They are fleeing these horrendous conditions, this, these horrendous laws. I mean, uh, and when we talk about, for example, even the issue of gender segregation, here it's considered, you know, oftentimes they discuss about it at universities. People have a right to sit separate from each other, uh, when in fact it's an imposition and we see its effects on people in Iran you know, women aren't allowed to go into stadiums, and there is the case of the blue girl who recently uh, set herself on fire. She died because she was going to be given a jail sentence for having entered a football stadium dressed as a boy, and her name is one that we cannot forget. Uh, her name is one we cannot forget, Sahar Khodayari, the blue girl. And again, the, these are the realities of life in the Islamic regime of Iran. It is absolutely right that everybody defends the woman right, women's right activists in Iran and, and, and defend women's right in Iran. It is absolutely right that the labor activists need to be supported and we need to demand the freedom. It is absolutely right that the environment, uh, environmentalists in Iran are, uh, um, are freed and we, we need to defend the rights to protect the environment in Iran. It is right uh, to defend and demand that the, uh, the dual nationals are released from prisons. It, it is uh, uh, absolutely right to defend uh, that uh, the, tour, the two tourists, uh, uh, jo Jolie King and um, Ms. Mar Mark Firkin, Mar Mark Firkin are released, the recent tourists who actually were crossing Iran. And uh, also all the other dual nationals absolutely. in prison. At the same time, while you do this, you must defend the right of the refugees and asylum seekers who are fleeing these horrendous uh, uh, conditions and the demand 
the right to uh, uh, to seek refuge. And also, of course, pressure governments not to deal with the Islamic regime of Iran. It has to be politically boycotted. It has to be shamed. And people in Iran have to be defended full stop. Mashal Afshar, it's such a pleasure to have you on our program. Thank I wanted so to speak to you about your work. You're a filmmaker, you're an artist. Uh, let's start with your films. You've done different films on Iranian uh, lesbian refugee women, on Afghan refugee children in Turkey, on political prisoners. Uh, tell us uh, what your inspiration is for your films and if there's any common theme in all of your work. Thank you so much, Maria, for having me in your program. Uh, I think uh, I, I, this was a big question in my own mind about the common theme and why exactly I'm picking some subjects when I was looking at the draft of my script. It, it was somehow, I can't say annoying because at the end of the day, these are what is inside you and should come out. Uh, but I found a chain. I found a chain between all these uh, ideas or scripts or films. And uh, in a way, I think uh, most artists, if, if they're really into art, uh, it, this is the, an, uh, a tool for self-expression. So it, it somehow connects to you, to your past, to your being as a human and your own experiences. And I had the same. Uh, but uh, regarding my first uh, film, which was a docudrama called Cold de Sac, mm -hmm. um, it was made in the UK with collaboration uh, with my colleague uh, Ramina Goudarzi Nejad, who made this film together. It was focusing on the issue of human rights, uh, but uh, specifically to do with lesbian, hom uh, homosexuals' rights in, in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. This was the first time that a, a story about a homosexual woman was presented in, in, from Iran and uh, it was well received by the international media and it opened up a, discourse, a lot of discourses, a lot of uh, debates about the case and obviously it had a positive impact on the way that the law was uh, uh, in, in the UK and the way that these cases were uh, uh, being considered. Um, but besides that, I think for me the major um, goal or achievement of this film was that for the first time I, I have a big admiration for this woman who took part in this film. She was so brave uh, appearing nude in the film uh, with her own girlfriend uh, although she was coming from a very traditional religious uh, family in Iran uh, but uh, her bravery made this film happen uh, at, in the beginning um, all, actually all through the film. Um, and the fact that she, op she opened up a dialogue, a conversation, which um, led to a lot of um, later works for other artists and uh, work for uh, other media representatives and journalists and to bring up this dialogue and to talk to each other about this matter, to talk to people about this matter, especially people of Iran who are not, still not, after many years of conversations about homosexuality, many people are still close to the topic. And they think other people's private life is their matter. And this is very annoying, <laughs> like when you think about it. Everyone has the right to be who they are. And it's no one's right to interfere, to uh, impose or to judge and th these were uh, very important uh, issues for me uh, and I'm very happy that I did this film and it kind of changed my life as well because I realized that uh, with your filmmaking you actually can have a voice, you can talk about a topic and you can make a change and it was very very uh, important for me at that stage and until now and uh, it made me go to university and take it more seriously, study filmmaking, something which was not available for me back then in my own country in Iran. Um, and uh, later on I, I again worked on uh, many topics to do with uh, women's rights and uh, women's issues 
I worked on the on a topic of a, a hymenoplasty of a woman. Uh, it was a short film for my university, which is a still a, a issue, and they do it here in Harley Street. It's just sad to think that in one of the uh, most advanced countries, uh, they still everything surrounding uh, money, and you know, so uh, everything is around money in this world, and even in the West, some many people do not challenge these issues that they're right or wrong at first place. They just, you know. Um, yeah, but um, uh, regarding the common thread between my uh, work, um, I think um, many, many issues, including my own gender identity, being a woman from Iran, from a Muslim country, Islamic country, um, and my experiences as a refugee in this country uh, had an impact on the type of films that I made. Or, the, or my choices in filmmaking. Um, and at the end of the day, I think um, this was my best way of self-expressing, um, to know myself better, to, to kind of open up my wounds uh, and uh, let them go, try to be more free of them, and also to communicate with others, because this is a, a very uh, non-violent way of uh, dialogue, uh, the art. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because you talk a lot about pain uh, and it's all in your films but also in your artwork, you know, uh, like Love and Scars, uh, the artwork paintings you have or uh, the summer of 1988, there is that thread of pain uh, that goes throughout all of your work as well. I think there, there, this thread is between us human beings, love and pain. This is something that we all share regardless of where we're coming from, our gender or you know, social class, whatever. We all in one way or another experience love and pain. And this is what connects us together. So, and in order to get to that love, maybe one of the steps is to talk about your pain because you need to let it go, you need to free yourself and for in, in terms of, because uh, my solo art is very, very uh, personal to me, uh, well of course film is a bit different, but with solo arts you are one to one with your medium and uh, it, it, in that moment I don't think of anybody else or is it going to be received or not, I, I don't even put up exhibitions. It's uh, maybe later, I don't know, in later in my life, but it's kind of self-discovery process and if something uh, kind of hurts me inside, I try to translate it in, in, in the form of a picture or drawings or sketches or things like that. And, and I think this is very important this, because I, I always have, I have some workshops about a relationship of art and um, healing and how you can use your art as a medium to heal yourself, to do therapy on yourself. Um, it helps you to deal with your deepest kind of trauma, the, the things that suffers you, uh, you know, and, and then gives you the opportunity to um, kind of look at it, look at it in an in a observational mode as well, like you put it there and then you look at it and you see, you find yourself free of it. It's like a magic happening in that moment, you know. So. Yeah. I mean, there's also a lot of focus on the body, isn't it? Particularly women's bodies, uh, because mm -hmm. I suppose uh, coming from your background where women's bodies are erased or hidden. Yeah. This is the thing. Women's body has always been a political issue. It's a battleground. All through the history, look at it. The, even half of the books coming from God himself talks about how women's body should be handled. Why so much fuss? Because they know where the strength lays, you know. They know this power, this power of creation, which, which is inside a woman. And that's why they try to restrict it, to kind of, you know, confine it or punish it even for having such potential. And it is very important to, for every woman on the planet to look at this, so look at her own body. Even I do, this is my kind of a retreat. I take off my clothes, I stand in front of the mirror and I look at my body. I don't even need to give compliments or be angry or why, why I have fat in my belly or this or that. No, just in a very observational, as a, as a kind of a 
phenomenal, you know, as a, as a phenomenon. Look at your body as if you look at a flower or, I don't know, an object, but just look at it and, and try to appreciate it, whatever it is, and try to see what is the secret. What is the, what is, where is exactly this power that threatens the world, you know? And then when you look at it, the magic happens, you become stronger. You, you find what is there, you know? And I really, I even to when I talk to my own sister, we always have this kind of sister dialogues between us, oh, do this or do that. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing because, um, you, you know, people are being told with so many lies, our culture, not, our, not only in our culture, even in Western culture, they're kind of objectifying women's body in, in another level. Um, in our countries, maybe desexualizing it, and maybe in the West, we're over-sexualizing it. Um, mm. So you become a sex body rather than being a body, being a human being, having a human experience. You're always labeled with your gender, which is wrong, which is a lie, you know. Uh, your gender is for you. And your sex is for you. It's n nobody's realm. It's your realm as a human being. As as if I always look at the nature you know, when it comes to. I look at the dogs and say, okay, which one's male, which one's female? It doesn't matter. Why why we don't care? This is a male or a female when the dog passes. But when we always care about, oh, this is a woman's body. Oh, that's. Mm -hmm. So these are all like kind of uh, manipulations done uh, by. I don't know the, where the root lays. It may be if you have to look at the history to, to find an archaeological term to find out where it is exactly. But uh, specifically in religion has been a lot of focus on this matter and, and it has given power to a lot of wrong people as well. It kind of guarantees, secures their power so they, they talk as a god, as a controlling power and so your body becomes the battlefield without you wanting it or not so um yeah what was the question so again in, <laughs> so i suppose in your art because your art is uh focuses on pain on women's yeah. bodies but also very critical of religion um yeah i yeah. Uh, I don't know if it is definitely critical. I have many elements of religion, and especially one of my exhibitions uh, um, to do with sacred seal. Yeah. Um, this is focusing on most of the women that you see in the, the photos are wearing a kind of a veil, and their context of uh, religious text, text and literature uh, on these paintings. Some of them coming from one of the ancient books. Uh, which is a pornographic book, but again decides how a woman's body should be. Like says, four things in a woman's body should be red, four things should be white, four things. As if you're buying tomatoes or you aubergine and you want to put criteria on how they should be, you know. And it, it continues. I'm not just saying it's religion. It's, it's many things. It's narrow-mindedness. It's trying to stereotype. It's trying to confine one spiritual be being into some very closed ideas of whatever your religion or tradition or whatever has told you. And this is wrong. And everyone has to... Uh, learn to take off all these closed, what do you say, restriction. Uh, restriction of their own mind. Yeah. You talk about um, art being uh, an important tool for building solidarity, dialogue, peace. In what way? Um, I think um, art has this capacity to cross the borders of language, culture, religion, whatever, you know, so art has this ability to uh, kind of attract anyone's eye and kind of raise this question or transfer the feeling to them because we are emotional beings. We, uh, we have so much uh, in common uh, as, as a global community, as human beings. We have so much in common, but we have been thought to focus on our differences rather than our uh, commonalities. Um, so uh, art has this capacity to, to build a bridge, to cross the boundaries and to start, um, like transfer those feelings or ideas or whatever you experience and you put there as a code or as a key to, to 
kind of send it to another person and they look at it and they think about it and they've, it opens up their mind to see it from your perspective without even you knowing each other language from across the world. So, um, so definitely I think art has a capacity to bring people together for uh, op opening conversations and uh, at the end of the day it's a it's a peace building tool in my in my thoughts yeah yeah there was a lady who uh, we were speaking and uh, I was talking about how uh, uh, you know she was asking me that um, she was a political prisoner and I said well you know you're in the UK you have this freedom uh, you don't have to cover your hair uh, uh, like the way it was in Iran and you have freedom of speech and all that. And she, she said, well, so now we have a responsibility to bring all those ideas into our work. And I said, yeah, but even try to live your own life as a human being would be a, um, you know, a lantern, a light in front of those who don't have this opportunity. They look at you, they'll be inspired, they know where they're heading. Because we have all experienced that we have suffered from that suppression, from all that uh, um, you know mistreatments that we received in our past. I've been to, um, I've been arrested a few times in Iran, um, and the trauma stayed with me for a long, long time, and the interrogations and all that kind of stuff. So uh, when I see someone who has the same pain, of course, somewhere in me starts screaming finds this pain and starts communicating and uh, but uh, but uh, again I give myself this liberty this freedom this this luxury of living uh, without any negative thought without pain so I let my pain I channel my pain to my art and then I give myself a moment of joy this tranquility this pleasurous moment of oh it's me meditation sitting experiencing me myself as a being not a woman from a Muslim country from a you know suppressed society or whatever just it's just a being like any like this grass or flower or whatever and uh, and this is why I'm here and I want everyone who doesn't have this luxury to know that this is where they should head to after they have gained all that, you know, right. their rights, their social rights, their political rights, after they, they you, this is where you end, to find peace inside yourself. And this is what you can call global peace as well, if you're heading, if you want to w walk towards global peace, you should first find the peace inside you. Thank you so much. <laughs>